Hey everyone, welcome to my channel. I'm Rebecca Mandeville, psychotherapist, family systems expert, and author of Rejected, Shamed, and Blamed. The next question I'm going to answer relates directly to this issue of um, new people coming into the family and being indoctrinated or scapegoated if they don't buy the narrative. And that is people who write me to share their um, deep distress that it that their own child is being turned against them by a family member, often a grandparent. Uh, I've had clients who've gone through this. Some don't know it until, um, you know, the child's in their 20s or 30s. Uh, in some cases, the adult child has actually realized what had happened. My book was laying around. They picked it up, you know, um, by some good fortune. They, they understood what was in there, the primary thrust of, of my book on what family scapegoating abuse is. And they have um, got in touch with my clients to share their, their grief and distress and upset that you know, grandma or you know, grandpa um, turned me against you. And this can happen uh, really as, uh, as soon as the child has enough cognitive ability and uh, the ears to hear it and, and, and the language um, appears to be sophisticated enough to understand mommy's bad mommy's bad granny's good i mean i'm reducing it to very elementary terms uh so all of you who have written into me saying ah, what do i do how did this happen in my opinion as a clinician one of the ugliest things ugliest parts of scapegoating scapegoating is very ugly and you to have your own child turned against you by your parent or other close family member, what could be worse? I've seen family supporting an ex getting custody when they there's documented evidence that they have committed domestic abuse, uh, horrific forms of domestic abuse. And if they're very uh, sophisticated, narcissist, and well-connected, they can influence the court system. And we need to get a lot more awareness about that in this country. They're ahead of us over there in the, in the United Kingdom on this. This is a, a really one of the most painful and impossible situations. I don't have easy answers when people write me, and I can't give direct advice anyway. Uh, as a licensed therapist, I can only give direct advice to my clients, but I can confirm it happens. The child can be indoctrinated very early on. And I'll tell you, if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you're in the scapegoat or identified patient role in your family. Well, I will say when my clients are in that position, I invite them to carefully consider whether their child should be alone with that grandparent or with that family member because you don't know what's being said in your absence. Why would they talk about you any differently to your child if, if they're doing it to you? These families, they're, they're dysfunctional in the sense of um, you really have to think of it more as a battlefield, a battlefield more than a family where you need, and we know this in family systems, we even use these tr strategic terms. You know, I'll ask a clients on my intake form, do you have any family allies? Anyone who supports you stands by your side, has the courage to, to advocate for you, to say, hey, it's not right what you're doing. Who's an ally? And some of you have nobody. So these strategic terms that I throw out now and then, um, this is directly from some of the great thinkers in family systems, particularly uh, Salvador Mnuchin, uh, Murray Bowen. You have to be able to think systemically and strategically to be a competent family therapist. And a lot of what I'm doing with my clients is strategizing depending on their situation. If they're in contact, why are they in contact? If a client chooses to stay in contact, how are they going to take care of themselves? Is it really serving them to be in contact? What price are they paying? What price might their child be paying or a, a, a spouse, partner? These are important questions to think about because I've known plenty of people who stay in contact, uh, 
frankly, because they're in the will and they're going to get a really, really big chunk of money when the parent passes. And I, I still challenge my client on that. Is it really worth the price of your soul? And I'm not being dramatic when I say that. Is it really worth the price of your soul to get that money? The next question I'm going to answer relates to this issue of sticking around for an inheritance. I can't tell you how much it came up in my qualitative research on what I named family scapegoating abuse or FSA. I can't tell you how many clients have come to me with this issue. And a blog uh, respondents, people who write to me in my blog and here on YouTube in a lot of the comments. And that is when uh, the inheritance is supposedly going to be available to you because the parent passed away and whether it was a trust or a will or whatever form it took, don't be surprised if one or more of your siblings arrange to have you not get your share. Sadly, many people who write to me about this have already given up. You know, they've been so beaten down and they've been maybe in the fond freeze for such a, a um, large part of their life that they they're, they just have given up. They, they're not even getting an attorney. It's pointless in their minds. And I'm not an attorney, so I don't give advice on these matters either. But what I do tell them is to go get a good estate attorney, someone who understands uh, these sorts of um, family situations, because they're not uncommon. Um, there's including when there's not a scapegoating dynamic, there's lots of reasons this could happen. But you're in a real precarious position when you're in the family scapegoat role. I have seen, for example, I had a client who, past client, I'll change identifying details. I always have permission to share before I do when I talk about past clients. They've given me their permission. This person was sober, working their AA program for 12, 15 years, something like that. And in a stable relationship, living in a beautiful home. They'd always been very successful in their career, even when they were drinking. They were good at compartmentalizing. And um, they were staying in contact, kind of dutiful, but staying in contact with an elderly parent, staying in contact with some scapegoating siblings. The siblings got together and somehow had it in their minds that because of the past and the drinking and, and some behaviors that working with them, we realized were complex trauma-based. The alcohol was self-medication. They were also undiagnosed ADHD more self-medication, just drinking to feel better. So why, you know, it happens if you don't know what's wrong and drinking makes you feel better. So they had cooked up some plan that um, they would convince the court system that my client was incompetent and there, or at least maybe even convince my client that they were incompetent. So they would agree with the court and they were behind my client's back working to set up a little trust, little trust for this poor mentally compromised person, my client, and they were going to have an allowance that would be spit out every month, put them on a little allowance of two or $3,000. Well, we found all this out and I'm not going to get into the details. Uh, long and short of it, um, he got every last penny and didn't even have to go to court because the financial institution realized uh, they were being roped into something that maybe wasn't what it seemed because a narcissistic family member, uh, particularly a sibling in this kind of situation can be very convincing can be very believable. 